Caddis Maximus here. This time with a review tear down the Cobalt one handed recip saw. This is the 6 amp orbital version, half inch blade stroke, 3500 strokes per minute. A long time ago, I did a video about the rigid one handed R3030, uh, once again, single handed recip saw. Came out like 12 years ago or something like that. It's been a long time. So, this I actually got on an estate sale. Tell by the condition of the box here how it's just been all worn and frayed and beat up. So the guy must have bought this just a few years before he, uh, or even the last couple of years. What I'm seeing down here is a manufacturer code of 1222. I mean, in uh, expecting that to mean 2022. Anyway, haven't had. I mean, I've had luck at estate sales, but. That seems the last couple of months it's been uh, either a lot of really high prices or, you know, they're random, kind of out of the way. This one was kind of out of the way on the outskirts of town. Saw it listed on Friday. Decided to go on the half off day or when there's usually discounts and either the tool hounds didn't end up there or the guy had a lot of tools, but I ended up with this Cobalt one-handed recip saw. So I'm going to get a review it as new, having only played 20 bucks, 50 cent, 50 percent off the 40 bucks, which is actually a reasonable price for an estate sale because these are about 80 new. So the estate sale was half a retail, and then the Sunday sale was half of that. So manual, basic wood cutting blade, six TPI saw in a bag, and then it's a carrying bag. I also recently picked up the rigid version of 6 amp orbital and initially I thought both the same company is making the cobalts and rigid but no the cobalt is just a bit uh, it just seems uh, a bit bulkier and slightly more cheaply made that's the easiest way to say it not to say that's really a bad saw for the price but and my rigid one is buried, but there just seems to be a bit more squared off edges and a little bit more bulk. Just kind of seeming like it's not quite as refined a product. But I won't complain. I actually spent <laughs> 50 bucks of that estate sale. It was actually a good one. Picked up. This is like a 25-year-old. They're known as the Big Switch DeWalt Rotary Hammers. This is the one-inch capacity. And this actually doesn't have that much use. It has some beat up, but that's really, that's, this kind of wear is considered low use for a rotary hammer. You'll know really worn rotary hammers. I mean, the housing will look like it's about ground all the way through from being slid across concrete so much. Anyway, I end up doing a video on this at some point. Also picked up a Milwaukee 6791. So these are a 2500 RPM high torque. They're a drywall screwdriver, so they drive screws to a specific depth, not to torque. That being said, they're usually 4000 RPM. So a 2500 RPM like this is more like a deck screw screw gun rather than a drywall screw gun just because it moves slower and has more force. So overall, just to say... It's not very often, but if you keep at junk sales and garage sales and estate sales, soon enough things will work out and you'll end up at the sale that has the stuff that you're interested in. And for some reason the hounds haven't cleaned it up. And finally happened to me. Even picked up a few movies. So once I get through this review teardown, I haven't seen the Jason Momoa Conan. Ended up with this in the... Uh, as the 4K version, so pretty stoked. I actually got the original Conan the Barbarian with Arnold Schwarzenegger, so we'll see how these two stack up. Got this movie, not it, super easy to find, and if you haven't seen it, set aside some time. It's known as one of the longest movies made, next to things like Red Cliff. This movie is three hours and 50 minutes long. It's almost a four hour long movie. Crazy to sit through that. Kind of a weak little strain relief there, but at least it looks like it's easy enough to replace. Velcro for the cord. Eight foot long cord. Decent rubberized cord. It's an eye shing, 300 volt rated. 105 degrees C, so at least you all listed SJOW. So this is a very, it is a high quality cord. Comes in.
just like the rigid the variable speed is I've noticed that on these one-handed the variable speed range is like from 0 to 50 percent and then from as soon as you go higher than 50 percent it just sends it in the full speed I never really understood that we have a little LED light I mean not the rigid has they're sp spread wider apart so they kind of uh, give a greater flood area actually it shows up a little brighter on camera but to tell you the truth if it's really dark and the whole purpose of these saws is if you're working under your house they're not meant for to replace a normal reciprocating saw they're meant to be used where you're just in a position that's so awkward that's much easier to use a power saw with one hand than it is just a hand saw something working with plumbing work duct work like i said under your house all sorts of height uh, remodeling applications where this is just exactly what you need. You need either hold yourself up or steady a piece of material or you just you need something that's just a little shorter and stubbier. That's the purpose of these. Nonetheless, LED light's not great, but it will provide enough illumination for you to see your cut if you don't have a, uh, a flashlight able to directly shine at it. As with the rigid, how it actually the fan pulls air in through here blows it out through here with a little bit of venting in the back for the um, you know variable speed circuit and get to buy the brushes it actually uses a drive shaft that goes through the handle and that's what drives the head easy to use orbiting switch but of course it just sticks out of the side of this tool like a sore thumb a little plastic switch and I certainly read reviews that was one of the complaints is people drop it and that switch just snaps right off it's unfortunate that it isn't low profile and they don't have some kind of lip or something built up around it to help protect it. Really pretty unfortunate to tell you the truth. And it may be hard to see the orbiting action because what ends up happening is this just enables a finger so as the um, blade draws back, the finger pushes up on the back of the blade so the spindle actually rocks up and down. may move a little bit more there so what ends up happening is it goes out straight tilts downward and then comes back in a steeper angle giving you more of aggressive of a cut does come with one surprisingly enough they're advertising by metal so that's going to be high speed steel teeth it's not a carbon metal blade and uh why not we'll just burn this blade up see how it does on the block of wood I will mention, I mean, it's just, there we go, a standard quick release lock. Not a lot of videos on YouTube about these, both the rigid and this cobalt. But a lot of people kind of complain about its cut performance, mainly because they're trying to hold like a 2x4, cut it with one of these, and it's causing the 2x4 to shake back and forth. And obviously, if the piece of material is moving, then the saw can't cut, so... People complain about kind of lower performance when you kind of realize that a lot of what your cutting is going to be doing is against something that's already more solid. Maybe you're using it to prune, prune tree branches or something. So here's a more realistic cut test of the performance of the saw for oh, full, <coughs> full orbit mode. I don't believe this blade is as good as Milwaukee's, but it is a brand new blade and I'm going to throw it away after this one cut. Got an old dry 4x10 four by, four by glue lamb which is likely not the kind of material you're going to be cutting with this but it is a nice test and uh, I'll keep my other hand up here out of the way so you can see I'm actually doing it with one hand and let's see what it takes on a like a worst case scenario where you may have to cut a 4x10 with one hand
I think that piece of stew, I was about to use some bad words. The blade's not blackened, it's not even hot. It literally doled out in like eight inches of wood. It was making pretty good progress, but I shouldn't be able to just run my finger. Wow. What a cheap blade. Unreal. I mean, it's really surprising, the cheap Sawzall blades. They say they're bi-metal, but sometimes you really wonder, because that is insane for that blade to have gotten dull that quickly. You can got a genuine old-school American-made Milwaukee blade. That actually made good progress. This made faster progress uh, than that other blade when it was new. So, goes to show you, you just gotta kinda... The thing about recip saws is they eat blades and they're expensive, but you gotta buy the nice ones, otherwise it is just a nightmare. That's kinda the deal with the Harbor Freight, like Warrior Sawzall blades. You'll spend more money on those cheap blades and it's a toss-up. Things like angle grinders, you can buy more cheap angle grinders and get more run time than you can one expensive one, but it's just the opposite with, like, blades. You buy cheap blades, you'll end up going through more money or more value worth of cheap blades than if you just got an expensive, longer-lasting one. A little hard on the wrist, but that was a 4x10. I mean... Uh, six two by fours put together old and dry so you certainly can make cuts with these using one hand it just takes a little bit more patience and a little bit more time but it's just like you can't do that physically at all with any normal recip saw holding the handle about out the end you got to get up closer anyway we'll get to tearing this down i was just noticing little pins those are security torques pin and socket security torques who the hell uses pin and socket Torx, security screws on a power tool? Uh, that's pretty shameful. Well, this thing's real special to tear down. You pull out these two three millimeter screws. That's what holds on the little guard. They just run through, this slides in, and they just lock it in. So I get the front cover off. There are these cro stepping on the cord cross screws right here. So in order to get the clamshell off, you have to pull this off to remove the cross screws, and you have to pull the chuck off to do that. So the thing to change brushes. So it's not even really intended for you to change brushes. That's the easy. That's the bottom line because you have to totally disassemble it. There is no way to actually pull apart the two clamshell halves or get out the brushes in any other fashion. Kinda lame. <laughs> See why they have they give you a five year warranty and they're probably just expecting it to last that long. It could certainly last longer than that under the moderate cutting duties that you'd use it with, but man, why make it so difficult to service? Spiral retention ring, just kinda like old round head ratchets would use. There is a spring, so the spring will be caught, and you'll have to tension and then be able to push it down when you reassemble it. So you walk it up, release the spring tension. This is a metal collar. Come on, camera. There's a little notch right here. That notch is engaging you can just see it, that little spring tab right there. This will be the actual lock pin. If I can get it out. So the lock pin was on this side. And then this, this must be just some kind of guide pin or something. 
And indeed, it must be just some kind of pin for this collar to kind of ride around on it so it doesn't get quite as easily stuck. <clears throat> then you can remove this collar. We can see one hole is larger than the other. Like so. This is taking a long time. The spring has, goes here. There's a little center portion that goes into the slot. I guess the finger of the spring would go towards the large hole. Pull that off. Pull off the little bottom cup. Then we have a snap ring. Well, after you've dealt with the hassle of removing the chuck X, I, I had to tap pretty hard on that little pin to get it out. We have a screw that goes this way. We also have a cross screw this way. They're on both sides. So if you want to get into the gearbox, only have to remove those. There is a tiny little snap ring on the end of this rod. This is the orbiting and non-orbiting rod. And the detent is actually on this little finger. It has a little fly on the rod. Of course, it goes through the plastic housing. So you have to remove that clip, pop this out, and push the rod through in order to remove the gearbox from the housing. But at this point, we could remove the clamshell. There's a tiny here, there's a little o ring that goes around that. Come on, light. That little shaft there. And then this sat on top of it. I guess to provide some additional sealing right there. Then once you do that, you can see how the lever will push out now. Well, you can walk the gearbox out and you can see the drive shaft how I was talking about it's designed to go right through the handle but you'll need to have the clamshell and two pieces to put it back together and all this is actually snap ring together we actually have rubber sealed ball bearing there ball support bearing there so there it does have a decent build quality I just wish it wasn't so difficult to work on so that little clip just to keep the bearing in one spot and surprisingly enough, it's a, it just pops right out. It is nice to see that is a tapered spiral. So that is a spiral bevel gear, uh, a nice helical cut gear right there. The little lens has a clip, kind of snaps in this little casting boss right there. And the obviousness of them not wanting the maintenance just normal Phillips head screws on the gearbox once you're inside it, but security screws to get there in a whole complicated process. So I noticed it was a little, uh, seemed to be lower vibration. Anyway, the gearbox comes in two halves. Those are some bosses, so when you reassemble this, uh, actually they're not bosses, they're hardened steel rods that have been pressed in, but they kind of act, and you can see right can see the line that they've been leaving I mean this thing was brand new I only did one cut with it anyway it also kind of helps hold the alignment of the gearbox together you got to make sure that this pin ends up in that little sleeve bearing so as this let me get the gear back in here so the gear turns out and that's the crankshaft and what we can see here is the counterweight so when it's drawing the plunger backwards, it's sending the counterweight forwards. A lot of manufacturers actually don't use counterweights because it's just a weight. It's just a bunch of extra weight. But I was noticing that it was indeed lower vibration. And then this explains why. Because when I was running through the saw or doing that big cut, I wasn't noticing my hand vibrator shake that much, to tell you the truth. Especially when the piece of wood was held solidly and it was a large piece of wood um but this also helps explain it so at least uh, you know for the price they're giving you a counterbalance mechanism and it's all kind of pinned and held in with a screw here we have you know some various pins around the edge and i believe those are just more guide pins or wear pins for the counterweight i will make note that at least they actually put in a fair amount of grease to begin with if you line this sideways and you can pop the counterweight out and yes, you can see there's a pin there, pin there, and a pin there. So those are just acting as hardened steel guide pins for the counterweight. 
I guess I wanted to pull off the steel plate just to see, and it's just acting as... I mean, I'm not... Oh, I see. So those guide pins are kind of for the side and for the thrust loads. Uh, it's just using the steel plate, and that's all it's down in there for. Those screws are really tight. It took me a second to figure out how orbiting worked on this, and I guess I didn't really understand them. I mean, I understand. The blade comes out, and then will hook down some and give you a more aggressive cut on the pull back. What ends up happening with this switch is when you flip the switch, it actually lifts up this back portion here. See, this whole thing can rock up and down some. On the top of the gearbox, there's these two springs that are always kind of, always, not kind of, but they are pressing on it. So when you're in, and see, orbiting mode is facing forward, standard mode is facing upward. So if we're in standard mode, that, the springs pushes downward, and so it just goes back and forth in linear motion. And by the way, I've talked about other reciprocating saws and how these spindles can rotate side to side. God, what is it? I have like a, an older DeWalt orbiting, corded orbiting, um, like 13 amp, big bad DeWalt Sawzall. And man, that chuck just rocks back and forth a ton. And people were kind of, some people could, were wondering why I criticized that so much. And they hadn't experienced Milwaukee's or even, and I'll give credit to this Cobalt. As we can see these two rollers back there, which are both helping guide the back end and increase efficiency because they're rolling. But since they're locked into those tracks, this can't rock side to side and keeps it nice and straight. And I'll give them credit for that design. Anyway, when you go on the orbiting mode, it pushes this up. And it's actually a ramp on the back of the spindle. So now... The front of the spindle's in a, well, this bearing can rotate just a little bit, but the front of the spindle is a fixed pivot, and so the back end is going up and down this ramp. So what ends up happening is that as it goes forward, the back end goes down the ramp, causing the front end to tilt up, and then as it draws back in, the back end goes up that ramp, causing the nose to dive down, and that's what, how the orbital action works. Super simple and super straightforward to tell you the truth. I'm going to add a little bit of extra grease to this gearbox and then I'll get it all back together. I mean, I'll have to give, you know, a lot of engineering has gone into this tool, that's for sure. And here we are inside. I think the rigid does this too. So it's actually a 120 volt DC motor. And then they have a bridge rectifier little resistor just to convert the AC and the pulse DC to run through the permanent magnet. And I think, and I've seen this before, permanent magnet quarter tools are not very common, even though they're cheaper because the permanent magnet ends up building a lot of material. If you're cutting a lot of metal with this, it's going to be sucking into the vents. It's all going to be sticking to that magnet. And too bad it's such a bleeding hassle to get these two halves apart because otherwise it wouldn't be too hard just to you know pop this up and clean that out so that's you're going to want to get in there with a air nozzle periodically the reason they do it is it allows for our slightly more compact motor with the same relative power they would have to use rare earth magnets in the the field to uh really i think equivalent a wound field AC motor, but it, they're still pretty darn strong. And a six amp one is still a six amp motor, pretty well built. We do have a pretty heavy duty amount of venting, double size, so it's pulling air through the motor as well as through the back and exiting it right here. Pretty decent commutator, pretty thick bars on that. So this certainly could last a couple sets of brushes, ball bearings on each side of the motor. So it has overall pretty decent build quality. Of course, this is where that drive gear comes through and is just uses this little drive shaft. Such a shame Cobalt made this uh, kind of anti-service, anti-consumer serviceable because a nice system like this too is that if this motor wears out, if they were to sell the motor, it's just that's all you have to replace. Brushes and the armature and it's like it's a brand new motor. You never have to really worry about replacing the field once again because it can't burn out as permanent magnets. If it does overheat really badly, 
you can damage the magnets. Magnets don't like being overheated because it can ruin their magnetism. Other than that, I do approve of the bridge rectifier. It actually is blocking these vents quite a bit, but it's helping keep it cool. They put a bunch of Celastic on it so it doesn't burn out easily. We can just barely make in there those little screw terminals, which is an odd, another odd, a screw terminals to hold in the power cord wires is a serviceability. It makes it much easier than having special crimp terminals and that type of stuff. But making it so you have to pull out the gearbox, take apart the chuck, just to get at them, I mean, my goodness, Lowe's. And, of course, it did have the obligatory anti-theft thing built into the tool. Anyway, I don't know how long this video was. This was a more calm. I wasn't expecting this to be quite such a bear to tear down. But there are no teardowns of this, so at least I did it. And to tell you the truth, I mean, the engineering of the gearbox is sound. It's pretty solid. Nice orbiting function. And the way it's designed, make sure that this spindle can't walk back and forth. So if you, I mean, sawzall blades flex a lot. But when you have no a nice tight spindle that doesn't rotate back and forth, then you can cut curves or try to cut straight. And you'll have bet it won't be perfect, but it'll work out okay if you're careful because at least the darn tool's holding the blade nice and rigidly straight. Just crazy how some manufacturers just can't get something basic like that. Overall, decent design. Like that it's counterbalanced. And like that it has a decent amount of uh, ball bearings in there. And, you know, spiral cut bevel gears and plenty of grease in the gearbox is something where they at least seemed like they're intending for this to last a while. It's just uh, some issues with the execution. And we'll try to zoom in here. Let me get a flashlight because we have come on get a PA6 GF30 so that is 30% uh, fiberglass reinforced nylon body so that is a proper power tool body it isn't PP probably polypropylene or ABS or anything like that so anyway that's my review of the cobalt uh, one-handed orbiting reciprocating saw and if you can get it on i got i mean i paid a great price for this but if you can get it on sale open box something like that these things can come in handy no they're not the most comfortable thing to use they have to hold a recip saw like this but it'll simply allow you to perform certain operations which would be extremely dangerous or just about impossible or you know using other any other means or you'd have to just use a handsaw got cracked pipes under your house and you're trying to support yourself or hold up one end of a pipe while you cut it so then you can set it down go to the other end and cut it that's all stuff that you know would just be extremely difficult with a normal recip saw and so that's the whole purpose of these i do recommend the orbiting ones because since you can't press very hard with one hand the orbiting makes a big difference of driving the blade in there and making a quick cut or making it faster. And and overall, I think they're a neat tool. And it's actually kind of surprising to learn that these things, you know, the Home Depot once again, I think it was 2010 or 2012 when Rigid introduced what I know of as the first of the one-handed recip saws. I'd still recommend the Rigid Orbiting 6 Amp one over this Cobalt though. I think it's a bit higher quality tool, but this one, you know, is okay. Anyway, thanks for watching.